Good evening, good evening, good evening, and welcome to day three of XConf. My name is Sarah Tarapawala, and I'm the Director of Enterprise Modernization, Platforms and Cloud here at ThoughtWorks Australia and New Zealand. And I'm very delighted to be joined with, tonight uh, with Jeremy Burton, who's the CTO of High Pages Group. A, a highly skilled and experienced senior technical leader with the ability to apply product, commercial, uh, and technical lenses, Jeremy has successfully worked and delivered across a variety of organizations from startups to large enterprises. As Chief Technology Officer at High Pages Group, uh, a prominent player in the Australian home improvement industry, Jeremy is responsible for creating a technology first in environment. So, welcome, uh, Jeremy. Hi, thanks for having me. No worries. Uh, now, XConf is a ThoughtWorks annual technical conference and it allows us to share with uh, you, our audience, the best and the newest research and knowledge uh, that we have built working with our clients around the world. This year is a um, first year for us because we've been running XCOMP for quite some time now, but this is the first time we've run this in this festival, uh, long week-long festival uh, with sessions in Brisbane, in Melbourne and here in Sydney. Um, and of course, coming live at you in your kitchens, in your living rooms, on your headphones, on, the, on your journey home. Um, and maybe you might be watching this in replay. So welcome everybody. Now this year, our theme is Better Together, Technology Cross Business, um, which really emphasizes how integral technology has become to businesses success. Now, in today's dynamic business landscape, aligning business and technology, which is where we've sort of been talking in an industry uh, in the past, it's no longer sufficient for driving true transformation and the sustainable growth that continues to meet our customer needs and demands. Organizations must venture beyond mere alignment and they must embark on a journey uh, to craft a truly integrated business and technology strategy that acts as a catalyst for enduring success. And that's what XConf is all about. Um, and across this week, we have a range of keynotes, talks, panel discussions, and hand-to-hand -hand we uh, workshops, all tailored to support this integration. And of course, that's the focus of tonight's live stream session, how to integrate our business and technology strategies. Now, it's not too late. If you still want to sign up for some more, more sessions late, that are running later in the year, um, there's one running in Sydney, here in Sydney, on Friday afternoon. Um, you can join it in our office or uh, dial it at home like you're doing right now. Darren Smith, the Chief Product and Technical Officer at MYOB, will be delivering the keynote, sharing his thoughts on the remaining authentic and connected with customers through good economic times and bad. So tonight, a um, little bit of housekeeping. We don't have to do a lot of the normal housekeeping stuff that we have to do, but um, we are going to be using Slido tonight because we do want to hear from you at home. Uh, we want to hear some questions that you have and what you're thinking about the subject that we're talking about. So I'm going to get you to do one thing for me. Grab your phone, um, take you know, snapshot of the QR code that you see in front of you and let's get you set up with Slido, okay? So scan it, you'll come across the, the page uh, for the Slido, just enter the details as, you, as it prompts you to do. And on there you'll see a poll. So for, while, we, we're, while you're kind of getting used to the Slido, I want you to, have you used Slido before, Jeremy? I have, it's really you good. Have? Yeah. So in just a few words, um, I want you to describe what strategy means to you. I'm going to give you a moment or two here because we'll tell you the answers, but we want to hear from you first. We want to get your thoughts before we actually embark on our session and our journey into understanding what you know, technology means for you. All righty. So if you don't have that, the instructions are to go to slido.com Enter the code hashtag XConf Australia at the top of the screen. So if you can't get the Slido uh, QR code, you'll know what to do. 
Now, evolutionary um, organizations are resilient in changing times uh, because they have integrated their digital capabilities to support their business strategies. They can continuously adapt from that position with agility, no matter uh, what source of disruption, and we certainly have had quite a few disruptions and will continue to have disruptions. Um, now, in the course of the many years that Thox has been around, but specifically during 20, 2010 to about 2021, we've been studying here at ThoughtWorks organisations, both large and small, to really understand what are the characteristics of a evolutionary organisation that will enable them for success. And one of the key ones is where technology is at the core of their business. So we call that tech at core. What we see um, is that as the organizations have evolved through time and we've gone from you know, the industrial revolution where technology was uh, the, the cost player, as we've kind of come through that, we're getting organizations where um, technology has started to get a seat at the table, um, and, but a tech at core is where it's one, it's integrated. So before strategies were separate, so we'd have a technical strategy and a product strategy and a human resource strategy. But now we're finding through organizations that are moving more at tech at core, the strategies are intertwined and interlinked. Um, and in today's dynamic business landscape, aligning that business and technology, it's no longer sufficient. And we've got to look at um, the way that we can merge these technology strategies, business strategies, product strategies, uh, all together. Uh, but what is strategy? <laughs> it's a really good, good starting question. Point. Starting point. Um, I mean, I've been talking to organizations for the last couple of years and trying to get an understanding about how, what they think about it um, and how they go about creating it. But Jeremy, what do, what's your perspective on strategy? Look, I think for me, strategies, it's really about how the organization moves toward, further towards its goal. You know, you'll often have a vision, you'll have a goal of, you know, we at High Pages, you know, we want to be uh, revolutionizing the way traders use technology. Um, our strategy is how we're going to do that. It's how we're going to meet our business goals, our, our aims, how we're going to create value for our customers, for our traders, for our consumers, and also, um, you know, create value for our shareholders realistically, I think. Um, and that, that's such a crucial bit. It, it defines where we want to go and it also talks about how we're going to get there for us. Um, I have seen strategies being created, many of them, and uh, as I've grown up and I sort of learnt about uh, strategies, um, I was following the traditional wisdom, which is look at your current state, look at the future state, dot, dot, draw the dots between them and then lo and behold, that's your strategy. Um, but over time, I've grown more and more uncomfortable with that method um, of, of strategy creation because uh, what I find it often creates this wish list mm -hmm. of all the things that um, could be done. But the value I find in a really good technology strategy is as much about what's left out as what's included. Um, and, you know, furthermore, you know, technology strategies are often created, they're, they're created in isolation. They're often created after businesses have, d mm. have done theirs. Um, and the results often infeasible business strategies, uh, which can't be achieved at, without considerable cost or time. Um, so I like to, ch you know, challenge that notion of creating. And I, I know in discussion with you, we've, you've actually adopted a really uh, interesting model, um, but I always liken that sort of conventional wisdom mm. going to the doctors and, <laughs> and you know, uh, them just giving you a huge body scan and coming up with all the things that will go wrong. Um, but a doctor wouldn't do that. They'd start with what your health objectives were, what you yeah. wanted to achieve, and then worked on the parts of your body yeah. that, that, ne that needed improving. Absolutely. So can you tell us a little bit about, you know, about how you create the strategies at high pages and a little bit maybe about the journey to, you know, CDO and um, creating 
learning about that. Yeah, um, sure. So I've, I've always been passionate about, you know, technology as an enabler for business, as an enabler for customers, for people, um, for commercial outcomes, for all of the above. Um, you know, I have loved playing in technology. I've been an engineer of some variety for nearly 30 years now. And, um, you know, going back to being a teenager in the dot-com days, really. Um, but, um, you know, seen a lot of different organisations and where they go about it. But for me, I had this recognition that you don't do technology for technology's sake. And, and you really, the more you can leverage technology to enable the, the business outcomes, the, the customer outcomes, create value is really where you get the sweet spot. And you, if you can bring all the organisation, all, everybody along that journey, you find an engaged group of people, engaged employees, um, and really great outcomes. And so in my journey towards being a C, the CTO role I've got now, it's always been about finding the ways to do that. It's always been, you know, working for organisations that have enjoyed the most have been where that's, that's a really big part of it. It's sort of, you don't get handed this business strategy that says, this is where you're going, now make it happen. And you think, oh, how are we going to pull that together? It's really been about, okay, what, what are, here's roughly where we're going to go. How, together, what are some of the ways we can get there? What makes sense from a technology perspective? How does the product thinking lean into that? Um, how does the commercial aspects come together and how do we bring that together? Um, you know, I've been really fortunate at High Pages, the last, been part of the last three strategy processes and I've seen this amazing evolution we've had of how we approach the process. Um, you know, when I first arrived, they'd already been on a bit of a journey and you know recognizing that strategy is traditionally can be a top-down type um type affair and um you know they're, they're trying to break that trying to get everyone involved and so there's this pro this idea of well here's where we want to get to here's a bunch of teams responsible for different parts of it go away and tell us how you're going to get there um and it came back with a bit of a wish list it yeah. was you know that sort of thing it's probably in a inverse way that you're talking about, but it was a, here's all the stuff we can do. And it was, it was hard to get that focus. So we learned from that. And the next year around, we, we had a similar process, but, you know, provided a lot more direction. Um, probably a little bit too much direction as a senior, senior leadership team. So it's a bit of a Goldilocks story here. I guess you can imagine what's coming next. <laughs> um, and th this time around, most recently, um, you know, our most recent strategy season, we took a slightly different approach. We've been learning each time and, um, we, we thought about, you know, where are we trying to get to? What's our biggest problems as a business? You know, what, what, is, what, are the re, what do we need to fix to enable growth and to get to our goal? Identified all of that, worked out what we needed to do to achieve that. And that didn't just include, we need to build this feature, build this product. It also included, we need to remediate some of this legacy tech debt we've got that's really holding us back because that's, without that, we're gonna go slowly. Um, so thinking about all those things together, set some really good um, objectives for each of the team and said to them, here's what we need you to achieve these objectives. Think about what it is that'll get you to move that dial. And, and that, that was a really powerful way to work with the teams and build that engagement with all the teams that they, they knew what they were setting out to do. They knew that if they, how, what they did connected to the strategy, to the broader strategy, but also um, knew what, you know, their, their fine, the smaller part they are responsible for. Yeah. I um. I often talk to people and they, when we're talking about strategy, and they're like, oh, you know, should a tech strategy be different? Should a product strategy be different? Are they different things? Should we talk about, you know, one thing? And the view, the image that I constantly think about is that of a cone. Because a cone, if a cone represents the strategy that the business is mm. trying to take, that, that it represents what the business is trying to do, and you take a torchlight, and you can shine that torchlight on different aspects um, of that cone. So if you, you know, you should shine at the bottom, shine at the side, you get different uh, cross sections of that, of, of, you know, of the shadow. And it's the shadow, the visualization that is really, you know, where you get a product specific strategy or a technology strategy, because you still, I, th I think that there's still value in expressing what you what the technology part of the organization needs to do mm. in order to achieve the business strategy but um and right you know I've, I've wrote a book blog post about how to actually write down your tech strategy um so that the masses can consume it and, and read it and understand it um but that um that cross section is still important but it's just different visualizations, mm. different viewpoints of the one thing, but we've got to work on that one thing together. I think that's a great analogy. I really like that when you talk to, the, talk to me about that. It's sort of 
pulled everything into place. I think it's a really great way to think about it. And, you know, doing everything sort of in isolation in silos, you're not necessarily get that alignment or you'd be reactive and not able to have that influence. Whereas bringing everything together like that and just having different views on it, it's a really nice way to think about the cohesive one. Yeah, that one. And that's what I mean, that's really what we're what we're trying to get to mm. at the moment, just that one strategy, not these isolated, siloed sort of strategies. Yep. Um, but I so I think that kind of brings us to the question of how do you do it? So, um, you know, you've explained a little bit about the, the last one, but can you go a little bit deeper? Yeah, so look, go in a bit more detail about that. Um, we, we, we sort of take our strategy period over a, probably about six month period from sort of go to woe each year. And, um, you know, it feels like a long time, but um, it's more to give ourselves time to think and percolate on the ideas. So we sort of start out in towards the end of the first half of the financial year to think about, you know, what are, what are some of our challenges? How are we going against what we thought we were going to do six to 12 months ago? Do we need to change? Do we not? And really have that sort of brainstorming. And that, that sort of sets out our, the sort of the thinking for going into the, into the, the core strategy session. Um, our next, next part of our process, we sort of, we get together, reflect on that and say, right, well, to solve these problems, to really, do we need to change direction? Do we need to just pivot a little bit or do we, are we going all right? We'll sort of come up with a bunch of objectives for the organisation. Um, and that, that's a really good start and start to think about, well, if these are our objectives, what's the shape of the teams we need to support this? You know, what, um, what are some of the key results we might want to drive um, to, to indicate we're meeting those objectives. You can see where I'm going with OKRs here. Um, but at that point, we sort of thought about a rough idea of resource allocation for next year and things like that. So we, we operate, we're lucky to operate in a really great cross-functional team environment where we give the teams a problem, a mission, let them go out and solve that um, in conjunction with sort of executive sponsors and leads. Um, but they together sort of take that ownership of that space and, and work to it. So we think about what those teams will be, give them the metric they're chasing, give them one leading indicator that says, if you can do move the dial on, on this, then you're, you're doing what we need to do. Um, they get about six weeks to then think about what are they gonna do. And one of the interesting things we learned over our journey was let the team come back with what they can do rather than, so rather than saying your objective is to move this conversion rate from 10 to 20%, we just say to them, your metric is move the conversion rate from X to Y, come back and tell us what you think is possible in the year. Um, which really gives them that involvement, to, that, that um, ownership to sort of dig in and think, what can we do? Think differently, think outside the box a little bit and, and come back. So we give the teams that idea, come together, look at how, they, they'll come back with, hey, this is what we're gonna do for the year. This is how we're gonna solve the problems. Done some high level thinking. Um, we believe, you know, X, Y, and Z will be these numbers. Um, that all comes together. We then pull that together um, and really sort of layer that up, I guess. So we, we come top down from a perspective, of here's the directions we want to go, here's the objectives we want to meet, but then bottom up from what can we actually do. And, and in having those two meet, found really good engagement from the teams. They, they, they really feel like they've got some ownership on what they're doing. Um, we can, the feasibility aspect we talk about, you know, what's possible, what's not really comes to the fore. If there's things we've forgotten about, things we haven't, you know, realized are going to be challenges, they're surfaced up, which is really good. And we get ahead of the game there. And then um, then allows us to sort of cascade, um, aggregate that up and see, you know, what does that do to the top line business metrics and, and sort of tweak from there. Yeah. So how do your different teams communicate their aspects of the strategy with each other? How, you know, how do you marry up your technology and your products teams or even just the different technology? Do you, so do you write it down or? We, yeah, look, I think we, come up, have a, in the end of this process, we've got a nice hundred page slide deck that talks yep. about our strategy, but it's broken down by, by cross-functional team and by functional team. So, you know, the idea being um, our product focused teams will be really trying to move leading indicator metrics. And then a lot of the functional teams will support in that or, or uh, contribute capability to help doing that. Um, you know, the, that's developed and you know, it's got a fairly standard format, but a lot of the time it's sort of, what are your challenges? What are your goals? What's your mission? What What are you going to move? What's your, what are your key metrics? And then below that, some sub metrics that, that you're really aiming to move. What are your initiatives? What help do you need? What dependencies do you have? And really making sure that everyone's across that and sort of gets an opportunity here. It's really important. Um, but that, that starts to 
to bring all that together. And then when you compile that, you get a full picture and you know, it'll, you'll be able to pull out the things as engineering that we need. Um, you know, one of the opportunities, we had, the refinements we did this year was that after hearing all those product based and you know, car based teams sort of thinking about it as functional teams, we went out and said, well, what do we need to do to help enable this or what challenges? And you know, the great thing about the cross-functional team setup we've got is that you do have product involved, you do have design, you've got engineering all at the table coming up with these ideas and having their inputs. So, you know, saying, oh, we've got a real problem with this part of the tech stack. Um, this is going to prevent us from being able to make meaningful change here. What do we need to do? And being able to propose ideas and solutions there rather than saying, well, it's going to stop us at someone else's problem or we can't achieve what, what's there, which, you know, it help, helps work through those, those uh, challenges a bit. Yeah. I've also had success with um, on larger organisations, especially um, write it, like writing it down in prose. So taking it out of the slide decks and putting it in Confluence, putting it down, links to everything, so that you can like sublink back to the to the strategy. Um, but then it forms really nice onboarding material mm. that you can use to bring uh, new, everyone new into the journey. So it's not just that strategy session sort of town halls that you roll out. Every time someone comes new to the organisation, they start with here is the strategy, this is what we're trying to do, and this is how the thing that you're working on aligns to the thing that yeah. we're trying to achieve as a business. That's a good one. Yeah. Um, so we've got our strategy, we've created our strategy, and then you've got to actually operationalize it and mm. mobilize it and yep. actually, you know, execute it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, <you know, laughs> Strategy's not worth anything, you're not doing anything with right. it. That's right. So how do you do that? What do you do? Um, in our case, you know, we break ourselves down into quarters um, and plan out a quarter at a time. I think there's a lot of work as the financial year starts or as our sort of strategy year starts to really bring it home to everyone what it means, have everyone understand the part they play, how what they're doing in their team matters. And then each team will sort of plan their work out roughly a quarter at a time. We're pretty agile. We don't go in saying for the next year, this is all the initiatives and projects we're going to do. It's more about, you know, at a high level, the team says my annual, you know, what I've committed to do for the year is to move this key result from X to Y. Um, so this quarter, I think I can do this to this um, with a bunch of these these initiatives. We'll run some experiments to validate those, those ideas and you know iterate on that idea and look at it there. And each month where you know teams are coming together, we, as I said, with an OKR basis, we've got a tool that lets us track progress and sort of really communicate that around. Um, you know, it's open to anyone in the business to be able to log in, read commentary on where things are going. Um, and that helps to create the visibility of progress. Um, as a senior leadership team, we, we talk about that monthly and, and track progress of, across all the teams monthly. Um, and that really helps to operationalize and it gives us an indication if something's not going in the right direction, how can we help? What do we need to think differently? Um, there's an opportunity here with, is there, you know, sometimes there might need to be trade-offs, those sorts of things. So, you know, then, then at the end of the quarter, we sort of track, we've gone and plan the next quarter at that point, I think. Anytime you're starting to plan in detail more than a quarter ahead, um, especially at a business our scale and pace, um, you know, you're guessing and realistically the world will have changed in that time and, you know, you will have learnt so much in that quarter that, that where you go next would be different anyway. Yeah. I'm, the thing that I sometimes struggle with, um, it's that fine line that you walk between the tactical mm. work that you've got to get done and the things that will start to achieve your strategy. Um, and it's, I find it's that it's a different, sometimes a juggling act to get the right, uh, it really is right level. It, there's, you know, there's always a penalty for not doing the tactical work or yep. there's opportunity you might miss out on. And, you know, it's, it's a constant balancing, balancing act. Said you, you just got to understand the trade-offs. And one of the things, you know, we're, we're trying to get better and trying to do a better job at is painting those trade-offs and really being articulate, articulate in, we could do this, but it's going to mean this, and that's going to have this effect. Is that okay? You know, we might slow something down, and actually, the the long term impact that's not huge, but it lets us do this other thing here. Or there's all these dependencies on this enabling team that if we slow this down, there's this flow on effect, or you know, not fixing some tech debt might make everything else slower. Bringing that sort of visibility up and thinking about the impacts rather than the, the outputs yep. is is much more important. And I've seen this, um, this uh, the OKRs, but the, the, where they really cast, start cascading down. So you start with that really business level impact, mm. the business value that it's trying to trying to achieve. 
but at every sort of layer down as we get closer and closer to like even the infrastructure layer of, of the technology stack, uh, we can actually start to see different metrics and how they apply um, and then sort of all cascade up to that um, overarching mm. sort of business success and that, and that sort of layering um, and understanding if you're talking about mean time to recover, where does that fit in in the overall grand scheme of the business value? Um, so we've been working with um, a lot of organisations recently on understanding those AK OKRs mm. um, and how they cascade and roll up and how and at what level you should be talking about things and trying to move, what move, what needles you need to be moving um, on. Yeah, that, that's that's a, the needles moving is a, the analogy I really like. It's sort of where we've got teams that are really focused. What teams focus on is what they need to move the needle on, and then we'll have a and that's sort of the the OKR type stuff. That's really what your strategy is about. Where are we trying to move the needle? But there's a set of business health metrics that still matter. So what's my uptime of my core service? You know, what's my mean time to recovery? My you know lead time or developer happiness? You know that that or developer experience. They're really important things around productivity these days. And um, I, the way I like to coach my team around that is we, we monitor these things. We keep an eye on them. We do enough to you know we know what. Our, capacity we need to keep the lights on and keep these functioning well there's going to come times where we see that that isn't enough and that's when we have to make those trade-off decisions of well actually does this become an OKR for a team to fix this problem because of all the impacts it's going to have on the business but the key there and always when considering these these trade-offs is articulating the outcome and the impact in yeah. so that because that's the best way to ca compare like for like it's not if we do if we don't do this things are going to be hard to work on well what does that mean? That means you'd be three times slower at building the next five products. Whereas if you slow it, you know, just pause something for a while, do some remediation, they become a lot quicker. That's a really easy way to, to articulate the impact. And getting the engineering team, the technology team to start thinking that way enables those conversations so much more easily and, you know, allows you to have that conversation at, at any level. Yeah, it's that translation of technical speak into business speak mm. that is super powerful and it's something that I coach all developers in. You've got to like, it's, it's feedback that I got yeah. when I was, <laughs> when I was start, first starting out. You've got to talk to business. Mm. Ex, don't explain it from a technical uh, perspective. But if we think about strategy, um, the question that I have for you is how do you get better at doing strategy, um, you know, if you, you're, you're an agile organization, you, you break your stories down, you do continuous mm -hmm. improvement, you do small increments, and um, you practice the art of the craft, or the developers mm. practice the art of the craft, and same with everyone else who's working at that, um, that daily changing layer. Uh, strategies tend to, tend to be revisited once a year, they don't tend to change, they, you know, a couple of years strategy, but they tend to be revisited. And so as leaders, we need to develop the craft of strategy making. So how, what do you do, you know, as a, as a technology leader to develop your own craft in this strategy um, and leading making? Yeah, I, I think, you know, when, when you're trying to learn something, do it more often. And strategies, as you just said, it's a really interesting one where you really, it's, a, it's an annual process. Um, we're lucky enough that we tend to break it down into a six monthly process. You know, we mainly do it over, over every year, but we have a think about it every six months just to make sure we're on track. Um, and that helps us just sort of exercise those muscles a bit. We also take a, you know, a bit of an approach of making sure we learn from what's worked well and what hasn't each, um, each time around. So, you know, I talked about our journey before and the first year, you know, to go in a little more depth about that and how we've learned. Um, the first year that I was involved, as I said, we got the teams involved. We said, tell us how you're going to do it. Your mission is this. Tell us how you're going to do it. The mission was vague, a little bit vague. Um, there were no sort of metrics associated with it. The team came back with heaps. And we, we sort of realised that we had this wish list and it didn't all come together cohesively and we didn't really get a lot of it done. Um, you know, we made some really good progress, but compared to what we thought we'd do, yeah. it was a lot of work in quarter yeah. five, right? Um, so, all right, next year, we sort of were thinking about that and how do we avoid that and realised at the last minute we need something like OKRs or something like that and so hastily pulled them together but ended up with a lot of teams contributing to the same one. Um, sometimes they were leading, sometimes they were lagging, sometimes they weren't 
as metric driven as they could be. And that created confusion through the year. You know, the teams were sort of saying, well, how do you know what my contribution here is versus another teams? Are we playing off each other? How do we do that? And that, that was a real opportunity to sort of reflect and say, well, what has been the challenge sort of almost meta strategy? What's our strategy for a strategy? And what have we learned? Um, and it was that w what we decided, what the iteration we've done this year that's helped us a bit give us more clarity is um, giving each team ownership of one, one of these metrics, one of these key results. Eight, you know, there's sort of five or six and we've got five or six teams responsible for them. Other teams have got very distinct sort of objectives that they need to help help achieve. And that's that's really helped clarify for the teams and help them focus on what matters. And we'll come around in a few more months time and say, well, okay, what, what's held us back this year? What, what could we do better this year? Yeah. That, you know, what have been the challenges and, you know, how can we learn and evolve? You know, it's never being afraid to sort of, you know, often people start with things like OKRs or, or a particular way of working and it's hard and it doesn't make sense to them. And so it's very easy to throw it out. And certainly I know in the history of high pages, OKRs had been tried before and didn't quite stick and so you know been abandoned a bit but I think what's been good to see this time is this perseverance to just continuously improve think about what's worked well what hasn't and by doing quarterly OKRs even the practice of setting OKRs has been something um, we, we've got better at quarter over quarter um, and then that helps us when we think about well how do these apply to our strategy this is I mean I talked a lot about OKRs here they're a tool for us to operationalize yeah, yeah. our strategy really and they, they play a key part in how we bridge the bottom up to top down perspectives. So that chance to, you know, just practice and practice however we can make it happen more yeah. often has really helped us. I, um, I, if, you, if you think about strategy uh, and the, the direction of where we're going as, as a holiday, <laughs> bear with me on this. Um, when I was young, traveling around with me and my partner, you just book a destination, you turn up and you, you rock up and you you tour, you, yep. you, you just work it out. The strategy was buy the airfare, buy the accommodation, and you're sorted, you'll work it mm -hmm. out. With a family, <laughs> <laughs> it takes a little bit more coordination. There's a lot more people yep. uh, that you've got to organize for. You've got to plan a little bit with a, with a little bit more care to make sure that there's enough activities for the kids to do. Um, I recently went to America and took the kids to Disneyland for the very first time. That's my very first time. Um, and I knew that it was going to be a complicated trip because it's big, it's Disneyland, and it's the, you know, the happy, the happy place <laughs> in the world, right? Yep. Uh, and so I thought, well, how am I, how am I going to apply the, you know, my, my usual strategy making, you know, holiday planning to it? Uh, and so what I, I, I actively went and sought a whole bunch of Disney blogs. And I did not know this before I started my planning. There is a world full of blogging for Disneyland. <laughs> and you just you imagine will, what sort of things. <laughs> well, you will find out uh, rope drop strategies and the best, <laughs> the best food to get and the, the ride order that you need to travel in. Um, and so I spent a lot of practice time looking at those videos, planning it out so that when we went to build the strategy and, and um, actually went go on holiday, all of that practice had enabled us just to have you know, a really mm. fantastic trip there. But um, it applied, we were just applying all of those you know, skills of practicing as much as we can, learning about um, you know, what we were doing you know, and applying them sort of to that, to that journey that we, mm. were, that we were taking. And we had a great that's, holiday. Yeah, <laughs> oh, it's awesome. Um, and and that's, that's it, you know, it's, it's just using what you can learn and, and yeah. just practice, as you say, practice, research, practice, put into action, learn from it. Yeah. Keep going. Now, at the start, we talked a little bit about disruptions, <laughs> and we will continue to mm -hmm. get uh, disruptions. So, you know, keeping a, an eye on the market trends and the emerging technology, you know, it really allows us to respond and to react. So, how do you keep track of the market trends that are coming out and some of the emerging technologies, and how do you talk to your importantly to boards yeah. about you know some of these emerging texts that are coming out look I think keeping up with all the things coming out it's hard these days there's so much I think you've got to use your team you've got to know that different people are going to have different interests and listen to them all try and filter what matters what doesn't um, you know work with talk with your partners you know I, I get lots of info from ThoughtWorks you know around what things I could be looking at and things I might want to consider and you know it's really useful as a, as a way in um, I think the trick then is to 
you know, focus on what matters and, and understand what impact it could have on your business, both from a, this could enhance us or this could threaten us, you know. And again, it's, it's translating, you know, we talked about translating to business speak. It's what do the board care about? They care about the viability of the business. They care about the responsibility of the shareholders. They care about those sorts of things, you know, which is ultimately around value. And well, how, how can technologies contribute to value? How can they help us be more secure? How can they help directors carry out their duty? Um, as directors of a company, in in a way, you know, I think AI is obviously the classic one at the moment. Generative AI, that's such a huge thing. Everyone's asking, what are you doing about it? What's it matter? And, and being able to sort of talk about real impacts to the business and real use cases and examples really helps um, without getting caught up in the technology um, speak, I think really starts to have that conversation. Yeah, we've been doing lots of um, Gen AI workshops with organisations at the moment. Um, to sort, sort of work out what is it, how does it play in their mm. organisation, but more importantly, is it an innovation that can help uh, you know, achieve what they, what they need to achieve? And I think that's the, it's, shiny new tech is fantastic, <laughs> yeah. uh, but we've got to um, ground it in what the business is trying to achieve. Mm. Absolutely, yeah, and that, that's, you know, generally it's like something we've, we haven't seen in a long time, where everyone's just, Almost, this is massive FOMO, you know, what are we doing about it? Are we going to miss out? Are we going to fall behind because we're not? And I think, you know, yes, there's a lot of opportunity um, and you can almost get blinded by all that opportunity and just sort of get lost in it and finding a path through of, of yeah, finding the things that matter, the things that impact, starting to work through that and, and, you know, gathering idea. you know, there's going to be lots of great ideas and being able to pull them together into ones that matter is, is where it's really crucial. Yeah, and Gen AI is, is a weird one of those emerging texts because it's kind of coming from the board down. Mm, yeah. Like they, where there's lots of you know, articles that are being written in business magazines, as, as an example, and um, the non-technical part, um, leaders of the executive team are asking, what is it? How can we use it? How, how can it influence? But if we look at any other emerging technology <laughs> that we've had over the last couple of years, it's usually the oh, technology yeah. leader sort mm. of fighting for the, the voice at the table to explain how this could really, you know, accelerate the business and what, what the business needs yeah. to do. Look, you know, cloud, cloud. Cloud's yeah. a great example, you know, and, and as a technical leader, knowing how to talk about, you know, the impacts of cloud, not just to, you know, productivity, scalability, all those things, but also at a financial level, you know, the board cares about what's this going to do to our CapEx versus OpEx spend, things like that, and really being clued in as a technology leader on that and be able to talk to that and talk about the benefits or potential drawbacks things you have to work around is super important. Yeah, I mean, it, I don't think a CEO would ever say, I want to go to the cloud. Mm, yeah. <laughs> but there's definitely the cloud is the, is the car to get to mm. get you on the journey. Yep. Yeah. That's right. Now, ladies and gentlemen and friends joining us from home, we're about to wrap up our little uh, fireside chat, but this is the part where we you get to participate. So if there's any questions that you have that you're thinking about, oh, I really want Jeremy to answer, I really want Sarah to answer, start um, loading up that Slido and start slowing them in and we'll start addressing them in just a moment. But yeah. before we do, is there any last thoughts that you want to wrap up and leave us with? Look, I think, you know, you talk about technology at core as a as a thing, and I think that's so important. I think as technology is playing such a more and more important role in every business, not just sort of traditional technology businesses, having that sort of multi-way conversation and having that sort of single view on strategy so becoming so much more important that the feasibility of, of what to do, just factoring that in is just going to become more and more important as technology is more and more pervasive in every organisation. So I think anything you can do to sort of bring that together and, and really have that sort of virtuous cycle of, of ideas and, and thoughts and planning and process around strategy is, is only going to help. Yeah. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Jeremy. Now, audience participation time. This is my fun part. So, um, as I said, we've got Slido open and I will just read some questions out and we can have a, have a go at answering between them. Sounds good. <laughs> All right. Now, the first question is, when I talk about legacy modernization, unless I articulate it as a cost-cutting opportunity, no one wants to hear it. Uh, is that your experience too? And is there another way? Look, it's really topical. It's a big part of what we're doing at the moment. We've made a significant investment. And it's less about cost cutting. The way I, I never frame it as cost cutting, I, I frame it as enabling. 
And by enabling, I mean, you know, Hybase has some legacy tech which is hard to understand for engineers, hard to onboard to, um, and is hard to make changes to. Now that means that when we want to innovate in our product, it's slow, it's risky, it's challenging. Thankfully, we've got significantly less of that than we used to because of the investment we've made. But framing the investment conversation around, you know, this will enable us to move quicker, to build more product. If, if um, you know, if you fundamentally pay everything back and you say, the way we add value is by building more product. Well, what's, what's the fact that, how do you build more product more quickly to get more value? You move, you either throw more people, which often will break at a certain point, or you make the people there able to move quicker. If they're encumbered by legacy, that's really slowing them down, remediating that will have a positive impact on your ability to bring more product to market quicker. Um, to You'll have generally have better um, employee engagement, which also brings about productivity. Um, and, and so you think about framing that lens about what benefits is it going to bring to all the other products and, and to our ability to deliver. And that starts to turn it from a cost-cutting exercise into a positive conversation about you know, bringing about long-term gain. Um, I, so I think that is one side of the, the coin. And the other side that I see uh, is really important is business liability. Mm. So the business liability that our organizations are carrying with these aging technology systems is mounting. And every year we don't invest in reducing that business liability is another year where we, uh, we're um, prolonging the impact and we're increasing the impact and the risk and the um, likelihood of that risk occurring, um, you know, for that business liability uh, yeah. that, that Southwest um, Airlines is a fantastic story that I'm using at the mm. moment where, you know, no board would accept tech debt, uh, sorry, no, no board would accept a business liability of like bil millions of dollars that it cost Southwest for reputational and actually remediation damages that they suffered in December. Um, you know, and yet that tech debt was allowed to grow and grow and fester mm. because we weren't able to have that conversation at that right business layer. So it's, you know, it's business liability, it's the ability to innovate and to um, continually to deliver to your customers. Yeah. It doesn't always, and it shouldn't be a three year, five year big bang project. It should be the incremental no, value that, that exactly, you can get. Exactly, yeah, you know, it's, and it's, you know, as quickly as you can release that value, the better, and that's, buys you trust as well, right? If you say, we've got this, we know that's three to five years to really get us to a good place, but within six months, you'll start to see benefit and people can see that benefit. It really buys you that trust that you'll get that, the, the ability to keep going and keep going and keep going. If you wait three years before anyone sees any benefit, you think about, you know, it's very hard to keep people on, engaged in that, that length of time. And, you know, um, strategies and executives can change in that period of time. And, you know, you might not have the support. so. Get the value as quickly as you can. Yep. <laughs> get it out there. Fight, get yes. runs on the board. Um, okay, so the next question is, it's one thing to track all the work streams that are taking place. It's another to change the way employees measure their own value to the business. Do you have any advice? It's oh, a good question. Um, f for us, it's been, been a journey of, you know, really educating, you know, taking the teams on that journey of, you know, understanding how what they do works at the, at the team level. So, you know, where one team, for example, looks, we're, we're a marketplace for those who aren't aware, you know, connecting consumers to tradies. Um, how do we get a great experience for tradies understanding what jobs they want to claim, what they want to do? Now, there's a team who looks after that, understanding, you know, all the work they do, how that impacts the tradie what the tradie does is, is sort of step one. So they, they understand I'm making it easier for a tradie to claim so they'll get better jobs that suit them bit more. You can then start to take the team on this, this journey of well then how does that then ladder up to a good business outcome and helping our direction. Um, repetition is really important in that, ca that case, you know, consistently repeating the message and thinking about different ways to frame it. Um, you know, if, if you say it once and someone doesn't quite get it, it's more likely to sort of slip from their mind. But if you're sort of repeating at different levels in different ways, it'll click at some point. Um, you know, that, that's from a, a team level perspective, I guess, and getting the, the individual contributors and the engineers to, to think about it. Um, that's, that's been some of the success we've had. And I think um, 
the employee value is actually a really important part of strategy creation. Uh, I was reading again, you know, how, how I learned about strategy and, and how to think about it. I read this book by um, a fellow at, uh, that works for HBR, um, Better Simple St Strategy, where they talk about um, strategy being your ability to maximize customer value and maximize employee value. So you need to keep watch over both the value that the customers, uh, that, that you're providing to your customers, but also the value for your employees. And by focusing on those two and maximizing the value for those customers, the business value just sort of flows on and the, the you know, your margins, they just have a knock on effect. But focus on employee value, focus on customer value, and then um, everything sort of just falls from that. All right, now the next question is, Jeremy, this is, this is for you. I don't know if it's pointed or not. <laughs> uh, what does performance culture mean to you? What does performance culture mean to me? Um, I think creating, an, for me, performance culture is, you know, creating an environment where teams are high performing. And, and for me, engineering is a team sport or product development, product building is a team sport. It's not an individual pursuit. Um, any engineer who sort of thinks an individual pursuit is probably not going to be nearly as productive or as effective as, as those who recognise everyone's got a different role to play. And a high performing team for me is the entity I think about. It's, you know, how has this team got everything it needs to succeed? Does everyone know clear on the role they need to play? And then are they executing those roles to the best of their ability? And, and do, do they have the capability to execute on that? And, and if you can get all those elements right, you'll find I, I, my experience is that um, you know you'll you'll find the best outcomes. You need to create that employee value, create that customer value, and you'll have great ideas. You'll have a team that sort of works well together, um, you know, and and and, ex and has really high performance. Yeah. Um, okay. So now the next uh, next question um, is: uh, in practice, if you have different teams for project and BAU, is there a way without changing strategy slash OKRs to incentivize project teams to deliver quality? <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's a tricky one. Um, I have pretty strong, um, what is it, strong opinions weekly held? No, I, I, I be believe strongly that project teams and BAU teams is a challenge. Like I, I recognize that there's, there's times you need to do it and there are times when it works, but I have a really strong preference for mixing the two um, and making sure that it, if a team is responsible for what it builds, you're going to get that outcome and they're going to be incentivized by quality there. I think, you know, by having the team separately, by having handover, you've, you've got to, um, you, you, you sort of negate the, the consequence of, of bad quality. I think you can, you know, there might be some micro ways you can deal with that. And, you know, if you've got people who on a project team, having them rotate into the BAU team for a while. I think if you know if you're stuck with the structure, because I can understand how that does happen. Um, if you're stuck with the structure, rotating people around is really important because that means that everyone feels the pain at some point, and everyone knows that you know is incentivized by quality, knowing that at some point they'll have to deal with the fact that you know if it's not there. Um, but generally, just you know, incentivizing, I guess, knowing how to reflect it's hard if it's a short-lived project team i think if it's a longer lived team then you know having that team still accountable for the performance even if it's not sort of handled by them in some way you know reflecting back might, might be a helpful there yeah i wonder if the premise of the the actual question is a, uh, an invalid premise because quality itself um i think should be just a part of your culture mm. right it should you should strive, yes. and there, I mean, this is something that ThoughtWorks talks about continuously, um, just strive for quality, strive for um, a really good product that you're, that you're making. It has impacts not only for mm. your customers, it has impacts for your employees, yep. for you uh, as a developer within your team, as a BA within, a, in, within your team. It has just such a profound um, uh, impact if your cultural and social norm is around high value, high quality, um, that you're not just writing stuff and chucking it over the fence. Mm. Um, I've seen organizations where they've had competing KPIs from, uh, sorry, well, they, seem, they seem the same on the surface, but actually they, in, in, they, they start competing ops teams versus delivery yeah. teams 
delivery teams being incentivised to get stuff out the door, um, ops teams being incentivised that their environments don't go down. Um, and so you get this real big divide between mm. the two because essentially they're competing KPIs. Um, but if you start with a culture um, of high quality, of, tr of um, not wanting to throw things over the fence, you know, everyone is, is here pulling it together, then that question is, you know, you, you can yeah. think about that completely differently. That's it. And I think, you know, think, thinking on that, I think, you know, the concept of the team, if, if you think about culture across, sorry, the, the quality culture across everyone, that, that effectively turns everyone into one big team. We all succeed or we all fail. So, that, you know, just because you've delivered what you needed to, if it's causing instability, we as a, as a broader team have actually failed. And because we haven't maintained that quality, uh, quality bar and you know we're not thinking about that in a in that sort of broader sense yeah so uh we wouldn't wouldn't get away with this evening without answering an ai question <laughs> um so just give me a second while i load up chat gpt to yeah. <laughs> do the answer <laughs> uh so how do you see your role as cto changing in an ai driven world um at a high level and i'm you know, it's, it's interesting. I think about this a lot and I think at a high level, my role as CTO is to think about where we're, you know, how we're leveraging technology to enable the business and, you know, contribute into those business conversations and, and to lead the business forward. AI becomes a part of how we do that. It's, it's you know, it, it may impact how my engineers work. It may impact that sort of stuff. Um, my role is to ensure that, you know, we take advantage of the tools that are out there to, to build productivity. My role is to make sure that we're, we're still um, focused on executing the strategy and thinking about how we can use those technologies to execute the strategy, but that doesn't change. That, that's fundamentally the same. I think, you know, the other, the other flip side of that is my role is understanding how to protect ourselves against the misuse of technology, right? And manage that risk and, and things like that. So again, I don't know that at, at a high level that it's necessarily going to change our role as CTO. It's just, you know, the actual way in which we execute that may, may be different and the tools that, uh, you know, the tools I've got available to me may well be different. Come on, confess, you're really a, uh, an AI bot here right now. This is, this is why this is, we didn't have good, anyone. Good this is why it had to be live streamed. We're just a, AI bots coming to you Indeed. live. We've already worked it out. The holograms there. <laughs> Uh, well, look, it's been a really uh, fantastic time to be able to chat with you. It's been great. Hear a little bit more about how you go with your strategy at High Pages.